why don't we get started? It's 9 a.m. So good morning, everyone. Um, and I guess if you're on the East Coast, good afternoon. I'm Alex Bui, co-director of the BB2K Center's Coordination Center. And so last week we had a wonderful kickoff to section two of our Fundamentals to Data Science web seminars, uh, where we're now talking about data representation issues. Uh, we had an overview of some of the challenges that was given by uh, Dr. Bandrowski of UC San Diego. So in today's talk, we're going to go a bit deeper now into some of the key ideas and issues in the organization of big data, uh, focusing primarily on the databases and repositories we use to manage and combine information. So we'll be getting a perspective on the evolution of databases and how they're changing to handle big data. So it's my pleasure to actually introduce two people who will be speaking to us today on this topic. So our first speaker is Dr. Shatanyu uh, Baru of the National Science Foundation. Dr. Baru is the Senior Advisor for Data Science in NSF's Science Directory, uh, where he coordinates the Cross Foundation Big Data Research Program and co-chairs the Big Data Interagency Working Group. Our second speaker is Dr. Elena Zaleva. She's a computer scientist with a background in machine learning, social network analysis, and online privacy. Dr. Zaleva is a Science and Technology Policies Fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science at NSF, where she's involved in a number of big data and data science initiatives. Uh, Dr. Baru and Zaleva, we're delighted to have you with us. And so without further ado, let's get started. Dr. Baru? All right. Uh, good morning, good afternoon. Can you hear me okay, Alex? Yes, we can. All right. Um, so I'm also assuming that you are seeing our slides. So actually, uh, what we'd like to do is this is going to be a joint presentation um, between Elena and myself. And as you heard, uh, Elena is uh, more on the machine learning side uh, with big data. And my background is actually more on the data management side. So it's uh, so she'll get started talking about uh, some of the sort of interesting machine learning kinds of things that, we are, that people are, being, are doing now with all sorts of interesting data that's out there. And then I'll try to give a little bit more perspective on the data management side. So if you're seeing, seeing our first slide, it basically talks about you know, technologies like databases, data warehouses, and, and in this today's talk, when we talk about databases, both of us are computer scientists, as you heard. Uh, we'll be talking about it more, a little bit more from the technical meaning of databases rather than sort of any community repository. So there's a generic use of the term database that generally meant, refers to any sort of managed data, but we'll be a little bit more technical about that. And in the process, we'll try to come cover some of the issues of structures, types and integrations. One way to think about what we will talk about today is maybe, at least in some aspects of it, maybe more of a computer science view of some of the issues that you heard uh, Anita talk about uh, in the last presentation. So uh, let's see if I, oops, sorry. Yeah, uh, hopefully you're seeing our second slide. So that's the two of us, Elena and myself. Um, Going further, the outline. Uh, so Elena will talk about some of the uh, data science task examples, you know, the kind of things we like doing. And what we decided to do in this presentation, in one hour we want to, we have to give you a very quick tour of all the things going on. So uh, we, I'm going to take a sort of historical view of data management, where we started and where we are. And uh, when we get there, I'll, I'll say why we are trying to do that. Uh, I'll talk about some of the current technologies and then, you know, where where things are going and some of the take home messages. So let's get started with Elena, who's right here. Hi, good morning, everyone. Um, so since this is a lecture series on the fundamentals of data science, uh, I thought it would be helpful to give you a data scientist perspective on why today's topic is important in the process of doing data science. And while you don't necessarily need to understand all the technology details of the data management solutions out there, as a data scientist, you do need to have a good idea of when to use one solution versus another. So first, I will give you some typical scenarios that data scientists face. Imagine that you're interested in one of these three research questions listed on this slide. For example, how do new research topics emerge? How do kids use playgrounds? How can you create more secure code? There are many different approaches that you can take to answer these questions. But given that we live in the age of big data, I will reformulate these questions specifically to take advantage of large publicly available data sets. 
So the first question was about how new research topics emerge. Network scientists may approach this problem by studying citation networks. More specifically, which articles reference which other articles and how research topics propagated through these articles over time. And as most of you know, one large data source of publication citations is PubMed. PubMed currently contains over 26 million articles and probably an order of magnitude more reference pairs or which articles cite which other articles. So as you can see, this is already a very, very uh, uh, a problem that uh, uh, can be solved through a lot of data. The second uh, a research question that I presented was one uh, that a behavioral scientist might be interested in about how kids use playgrounds and more specifically the angle on this question that I'm taking he uh, here is what do user generated videos uh, on playgrounds tell us about how kids use playgrounds so for example in September this year Google released a data set for research purposes from YouTube which contains 8 million videos and around 1.5 terabytes of data and each video is actually tagged by the entities that are uh, included in the different frames of the video and you can actually search by entities so for example if I search for playground I can find that this data set that contains 255 videos of, of playgrounds that's great 255 videos is not a lot of data right it's only 255 However, for you to extract these videos and do analysis on these videos, you need to download the full 1.5 terabytes of data and find these videos in order to do analysis on them. The third research question that I presented was uh, about how to create more secure code. And it's a question that, research, uh, that security researchers might be interested in. The specific um, angle that we can take on it is what you can learn from uh, version updates of code repositories in order to create more secure code. And as an example here, I'd like to give GitHub. GitHub is a, a very uh, popular uh, tool amongst um, software developers, and it currently contains of over 38 million repositories. Moreover, uh, Google actually made uh, 2.8 million of these repositories available for uh, querying through Big, Big Query. And this is already over three terabytes of data. And here I'm just giving a specific example of, of a few uh, such repositories that are related to computational biology. So all these three uh, tasks actually uh, require processing large amounts of data. And today we're not going to talk about how we're going to answer these questions but uh, we will actually talk about how we can process such data. So um, when you answer research questions with data, there are many different sources of data that you may have access to. Some of them may have structured data, others semi-structured data, but the majority of data out there falls in the category of unstructured data. Structured data is data that has a predefined data model, such as data in relational databases, and it is fairly straightforward to query. Semi-structured data is a type of structured data where your schema is often contained within the data itself. And some examples include XML and, and JSON files. Unstructured data does not have a predefined data model, which makes them harder to query. And some examples include scientific articles where you can have a mix of figures, algorithms, and text, and where each article may have different section structures. So one may start with introduction and then related work and then go on to algorithms and another one may start with an introduction and then jump into uh, actual data analysis. So um, uh, video data is another example where the video frames do not follow necessarily a predefined data model. And lastly, code repositories can have different folders and, and file structures and, and types. Now that you know what kind of data you're dealing with, you need to decide on where you will store the data and how you can query to answer your questions of interest. All three tasks that I described require you to process large amounts of data, and there are many solutions to storing and managing large data sets that exist out there. One can easily spend a lot of time exploring and trying to decide on the best tool uh, to use. Do you use the latest tool? Do you stick to using what you feel most comfortable with? 
And the answer is it depends. Some of these tools provide a similar set of capabilities. Others are complementary to each other. For example, if you're a software application developer, you may store the data that your application collects in a MySQL database. But you may want to export it to a Hadoop cluster or cloud service in order to enable fast analytics on it. You may also want to use a Redis store for the results from your analytics engine so that your application has fast access to, access to your analytical results. Something that plays an important role in deciding on the best tools to use for a specific task is the characteristics of the data that you're dealing with. You need to take into consideration the volume of the data, its variety and diversity, whether it's streaming and at what speed, and also what you plan to use the data for, whether it's an internal report that you need to generate once a day, or whether it is to produce analytical data that has to be made available in real time. And today, instead of making specific recommendations on which tools you should use or talking about low-level details of the technology behind them, we would like to take you on a journey in the history of databases and how the different modern tools came to be and why they're important. All right. Uh, thanks, Elena. So I'm going to then switch into sort of the history mode. And uh, as I said, we, we sort of decided that we might want to uh, give you more of an overview of the landscape of what's out there. So uh, if any of you are computer science people or have been interacting with computer scientists, especially with all the recent stuff going on with uh, big data and, you know, and the whole focus on data, you might have heard uh, people talking about, well, so what's what's new here? You know, are, are we doing anything different? And, and uh, how does it relate to what we've already been doing? So we thought we'd give you a perspective kind of on where we are coming from, which we hopefully will help understand where we are going. You know, so where, where we are today and and where we are going. Um, I think the the take home message, uh, which I actually have a slide on that at the end, but to give you right up front is. Um, we are now in a situation where there are a lot of choices available to us. Uh, that's good and bad. I mean, it's bad in the sense that that means you have to understand what your choices are and make the right decisions. But it's good in the sense that uh, depending on the kind of problem you're tackling, like you had three different examples, uh, you could actually choose uh, different solution methods. Uh, and again, as I will say at the end, that some of it may depend on how much freedom you have. You know, are you doing it for yourself? Are you in a corporate context where you don't have uh, you know, maybe you don't have as much control. But anyway, let, let's launch into this. One more thing I wanted to say before uh, getting a, uh, starting is um, I, didn't, I didn't actually uh, introduce, uh, spend a minute introducing ourselves. So just to reiterate, uh, Elena is a AAAS fellow here at NSF, but from next year she's going to be uh, on the faculty at the University of Illinois Chicago. Uh, I'm here at NSF, as you heard, but I'm actually here from the University of California in San Diego. So I'm, I'm a UCSD person and I have a couple of references to uh, UCSD projects. And uh, and as you heard last week um, uh, from Anita Bandrowski uh, is also you know from UC San Diego. Okay, so um, if you think back to, you know, way back when, uh, fundamentally what people were doing was writing programs uh, dealing with files. Um, and that actually takes us all the way back to sort of the beginning of computing, right? So 1950s, 60s, where every time you thought about a problem that you wanted to solve, whether it's, in a, and by the way, um, another way to think about the history also is how many people were doing this and where, where were they doing it? So in, in the early days, there were actually very, very few people doing this kind of, com any kind of computing. And most of it was happening in, in, in corporate settings. So you can think about, in corporate settings, people wanting to do inventory control or finance systems or doing some kind of computational, uh, uh, you know, computing uh, something uh, related to whether they were modeling a physical process or whatever. Uh, every activity started with you you're having to write essentially an ab initio program, and the program had to deal with uh, its own data. Now that quickly moved into uh, a setting where uh, let me. Yeah, that quickly moved into a setting where you know there was plenty of data and you had to deal with uh, somehow making it more efficient. So, from literally flat files of data, uh, people invented new ways of getting more efficient access to data. That's what we call structured files. And uh, oh, sorry, there you go. 
Uh, and you move forward to the 60s and 70s where we have uh, programming languages uh, like TL1, COBOL, things that many of you may not have heard of. Uh, actually, some of those are probably still running, uh, you know, old systems. Uh, but basically, that was a world where you were dealing with fairly uh, slow hardware and, and disks were much slower than memory. Uh, today, disks are still slower, but there's a much, much more fine hierarchy of storage between disk and memory. In those days, it was pretty simple. It was either a disk or a memory. And so you had to do something to uh, bridge across that. Um, and, and so then we come to uh, a situation where we have, therefore, application logic. So remember that anything that you wanted to do with data, you would have to write a different program, right? So you have the so-called application logic that's encoded in those programs. And those programs also hardware uh, the data that they're uh, going after. Um, but the, and the kind of uh, models that uh, uh, the situation that people uh, found themselves in was that multiple different programs were creating the same data over and over again. So if you had, you might have multiple applications in a, in a corporate context that are all dealing with employees for one reason or the other. Maybe one is payroll, the other is benefits. Uh, and they were all recreating this employee information. So the realization came that, you know, we are having inconsistent data and we are duplicating data unnecessarily. So that's sort of the start of thinking about data as something separate from the application that's working on the data. And that's a very important concept in computer science is the abstraction concept that begins to separate application logic from the data. If we think of it very easily that there's a database, I can go and write SQL queries and, and get you know, all sorts of ad hoc uh, information out of a database. That was not the case before where the application was very tightly tied to the kind of data it was dealing with and multiple applications created the same data, right? Because there was really no sharing going on. And the reason I'm harping on that is, you know, some of this may come back to us and some of the present world might look like that, but you know that's where we came from, and we realized that we should separate those out. Um, and there were these models called hierarchical and network models. So hierarchy is the most obvious way you can think about organizing information. You have a corporation, you have departments, you have people working in departments. That sounds hierarchical, or you know you have a human. Uh, humans have different organs, and uh, and then there, you can organize the human system as you know, a bunch of different organ systems and that sounds like a hierarchy. But soon what happens is um, you might say, or think about courses, right? So you have courses and in a university, uh, courses have offerings. So I offer a course this fall, next spring, etc. Uh, each offering has students. But what if you wanted to ask a question that says for each student, tell me all the teachers uh, that are interacting with that student. That becomes a very difficult query to answer if it's hierarchical in nature because you have to sort of go up the hierarchy, find out for each person who is the, uh, which course they're in, and then for that course, who's the teacher. So when people uh, found these kind of, that there are inefficiencies here, the, the network model was created which should say, well, maybe for each student, I should just make pointers to all the teachers, right? If I'm asking this query very often about which student, which, you know, what is the set of teachers teaching the student? But if you, as you think about more and more such sort of queries that you want to do, the, the structure becomes very complicated. So that led to the need for people to think about what is a more abstract way in which we can represent this information so that any query more or less could be equally well answered and not just stuff that are hard coded into the database, right? And that leads to this model that we now have is the relational model where we say, let's store all information uh, in tables, uh, and there is some uh, theory behind you know how we develop these tables and how we make sure that we're not re re uh, repeating information. So we remove replication, uh, we increase the consistency of the database, and that's our relational databases. Um, and that's when we realize that the notion of a database now in computer science then is that there is something called a data model, which is a formal definition of, of how data is represented. And then there is actually a formal query language that we can build on top of it. So relational databases are kind of set-oriented data models. There are relations, there are dependencies uh, but, uh, among columns in a relation and between relations. And then we can define a formal algebra, uh, which ends up being embodied in, in SQL. Okay. 
okay. Um, it also, uh, by then, the kinds of things we were doing with data uh, were of two types. One was what you would call transactions. You know, uh, again, this is in a corporate context where data is coming in, data is being updated, uh, you might be doing purchases, you might be at a bank, you're doing bank transactions. So there's a whole uh, uh, set of technologies related to transaction processing that are essentially doing insertions, deletions, updates on data. And then there's a whole set of things about doing queries. Um, and remember in the old days it was about writing, you know, for each query you wanted to do, you literally had to write a program. So the technologies was about can we do common technology that can support both. So transaction processing versus query processing. And I would say from around the 1980s onward when the relational model came up, uh, the idea was let's use one system to do it all. Now as we progress, so as, and which was ended up being a success, uh, relational model when it started was not viewed as that it might be successful. There are all sorts of issues because um, uh, it was in a way slow to begin with compared to existing technologies, but a lot of work was done to make it more efficient. Uh, and, and as it became successful, it sort of became the thing that everybody wanted to use to store data. So then you got into these problems where people said, um, as you heard uh, earlier, uh, that the data was getting more complex. People wanted to store more things like images uh, or strings or, or even videos. So people wanted to store objects that were more than what a standard database would support. So typical database might support your basic data types like integers, um, um, oops, sorry. Likes. I apologize, there's some interruption going here. Okay. Maybe I should put this. Okay, uh, I think I'm back. <laughs> um, so the question was, how do you support objects uh, in, in this, and uh, as we move to the 90s, we are also talking about more object-oriented programming, so uh, objects in C++ and Java. Um, and um, the other was the need to support, as I say, things like text, uh, video, images, and this is the start of the first time we start seeing this notion of variety. Uh, these, in this case, it's a variety of different objects want to store in the same database. Um, and this is because the success by then of the relational model meant that everybody wanted to use that as the one-stop shop for data management. But then it starts putting stress on the technology, right? So as we move forward from there, um, we also get to the place where we are putting more and more data in these systems uh, and more and more people are using data. Remember we started by saying uh, there were not that many people actually using computing and of course by the 80s and 90s this is all over the place. So there's a lot more data that's being generated that has to be managed. And the question was, you know, how do we build efficient systems to do that? <clears throat> so by the mid 90s, we had so-called parallel database systems. And these were still using the relational model, still supporting SQL, which are very popular by then, but then providing uh, ways of processing all that in parallel. And th there's a big sort of industry around that uh, to support uh, big clusters and, and parallel computing uh, on, on SQL databases. But then we come to the situation where especially uh, the internet web scale companies like the Googles and Facebooks uh, have arrived on the scene and they are seeing even more data, right? So this, this is the even more volume problem. And actually along with that also goes sort of the speed at which the data is arriving. So there's also a problem of uh, sort of streams what we would call the velocity. Um, and in a way, uh, I don't know if you can call it abandoned, but you know, those companies realized that the relational technologies that had built up uh, over the years, over the decades, uh, was a little bit complicated to use for these extremely large data. It does take a while to put your data in, to structure it, and, uh, and also in these cases, the data was not structured. It had this sort of semi-structured a characteristic to it because a lot of it was social media data coming in through uh, websites uh, or weblog data which was not well structured. So uh, that brings us systems like Hadoop which are massively parallel 
uh, massively ro and, and very robust for the, for the level of parallelism they have. So li literally, you're talking about thousands of nodes of computers running, and and there's robustness across across it because, um, in some sense, you can say the it was a very simple model that was implemented that ensured that uh, the overall system was very robust. Okay, um, and and that's uh, enhanced by the fact that hardware was relatively cheap and we had to really literally deal with petabytes of data uh, that we are now seeing in, in many different domains. That also meant that uh, the implementations had to be simpler. You couldn't support the real complexity that SQL had agglomerated by then. I mean, by, by this time, SQL is almost like a full programming language. You couldn't really implement all of that on massive petabyte systems. So all of a sudden, the language became simpler. And so you started hearing about things like NoSQL, um, which was meant to be simple SQL in the beginning. And now people call it all sorts of different things, including not only SQL, because an interesting trend that's happening that has happened already in, in the Hadoop-based massively parallel systems is SQL is coming back, right? People are now implementing more and more of SQL on top of these systems. So this is where back to the future <laughs> kind of uh, feeling comes back and, and that's why we wanted to take you through this history as to you know trying to make sense of all the stuff that's going on. So we started with simple query languages, uh, no SQL because people realize that even with those petabyte systems there are some very basic things you should be able to do like filtering data out, uh, doing simple aggregations, what in SQL you might call group by, right? Uh, making aggregates uh, on certain attribute values, maybe uh, maybe a date value, maybe the name of a person, whatever it is. So simple aggregations were important. And that brings you back into this world of having some sort of query language on top. At the same time, there's all this um, essentially unstructured stuff going on that Elena mentioned. And, and things like JSON become very popular and all the web stuff becomes popular. So people want to take uh, things that they are creating in their programming languages and dump it straight into the database. So these systems have been uh, required to support things like JSON now as a data model. So we have databases like Cassandra and also on all of those, uh, sort of many of those and NoSQL databases uh, are going into that uh, semi-structured mode uh, and not the full, necessarily the full relational model. Now, relational model has not gone away. So this is where your menu of options increase. So you still have the relational model. You have you know, pure Hadoop if you want, really. Um, or you could have SQL on top of Hadoop, or you could have JSON. So this is where all the choices uh, keep increasing. Um, <clears throat> and finally, I think where we are right now is if you're looking at it from a corporate point of view, and also increasingly as individual scientists, as we are solving more complex problems, we want to deal with many sources of data. It's not just one necessarily one. There, there's clearly a whole group of problems, including maybe in sort of things like next generation sequencing and so on, uh, where there's one data type, maybe it's the genome sequence or it's the social media interaction graph uh, that you're trying to mine and learn more from, or maybe it's just videos. Um, but there are also now increasingly more problems where you want to put multiple different data sets together. Maybe you want to put sensors together with electronic health records, et cetera. And that brings us to this world of very heterogeneous uh, data sources. And one concept that has now emerged is this notion of a data lake. And we'll say a little bit more about that. But essentially, it's the idea that you can dump all sorts of different data into one place. It's loosely structured, and that's the sort of analogy to a lake. Uh, but at least it's all in one place, and you can do something with it. Okay, So that's the full circle. We've come around. <laughs> if you remember, we started in the 50s and 60s, and here we are now. So we want to say a little bit more about uh, some of these uh, concepts um, and where we might be going. So let's talk a little bit about this idea of data warehouses versus data lakes. So data warehouses started uh, probably in the late 80s to the 90s uh, when there were, uh, you know, people had already rationalized their data systems into relational databases or whatever, so they reduced the redundancy in data. But what they did realize that is that there were multiple different databases even within a large company. It could be geographic regions, you know, maybe Europe, they had a division in Europe and a division in, in the U.S. or the East Coast and West Coast had their own data, or uh, the finance guys had uh, one set of coherent data sets and the sales guys had a different set of coherent data sets. And when people wanted to make 
do decision support uh, in, inside such a uh, system, they have to bring all of these data together. So the data warehouse is really the concept that if you want to get a more holistic view of whatever it is that you're looking at, you do have to bring data from different places together. And that led to this creation of warehouses. So the data warehouses started at the time when people said, oh, you know what, these data are not just about transactions. Um, the other thing to remember is a lot of the roots of data management community actually do come from industry because that's where, uh, uh, interestingly, that's where data started initially with the boom of data. The science folks were doing their own little thing and they were not really using these technologies. And if you come back to today, this is also where big data started was actually back in industry because, again, they were dealing, they just had the imperative to deal with the data and they had to do something about it, right? So uh, the data warehouses was a situation where business said, all this data that we are collecting, can we do something more with it in terms of decision support and strategy? So, but what they realized uh, that when they started putting that together is that there was some diversity in the way that these different databases were being created, even if it was within one enterprise, one big company or whatever. Uh, and that led to some heterogeneity. And so when you put all of this stuff to back together, and let's say you're trying to get one common view of your customer, uh, but there may be a slightly different view of the customer in the finance database and a slightly different view in the sales database, uh, this is where you have to start generating metadata to say things like, okay, what we are calling a customer ID over there uh, is you know something el else ID over here. Uh, so data warehouses are typically associated with um, being heavily cleaned up in that way, uh, having metadata. Um, and, and there are a lot of rules about what can get into a data warehouse and what doesn't get in, so that when you use it, it's a very sort of a clean uh, data set. Okay? And if you've dealt with any data, you know that you know, cleaning up data is, is a big, big task, and you might have to make some difficult decisions about what goes in and what doesn't go in. Uh, the flip side of it, the data lake is kind of the opposite. Uh, you put everything in. Um, you, you can imagine that uh, structuring, cleaning, and putting stuff into a data warehouse implies uh, that there is some time and effort involved, and also implies that there may be some delay involved. That is, from the time you, you actually receive the data wherever you might have got it in your operational system, till the time it gets into a data warehouse, there's a delay. Uh, therefore, if you're, when you're querying your warehouse, you may not be getting the latest, greatest data uh, that the corporation might have. Well, so Lakes were try are trying to solve that problem to say, look, there are some applications where I just need the latest data. Even if it's dirty, I'm going to deal with it. So remember, it's back. you may be back to the situation where you might be writing individual applications that are working with the data lake, but you're having to do it just because you want to get the current status and you're not happy with something that's a part one quarter old or, or even a month old or, or even maybe a week old. So that's kind of the difference between these two environments. Uh, data warehouses are provide you single consistent store of data, um, but they require you to transform and ingest the data into a warehouse. There's a notion of a star schema. Um, okay, let's see. The, this image just shows you that you know, you're kind of getting data from different sources. There is some step of so-called integration you have to do, which is all the cleaning up and the rationalization before you can put it into a warehouse. So there is work involved there. But then it enables a lot of different applications. The notion of a star uh, schema is the reason you create data warehouses, as I said, is in order to get this holistic view. It's the holistic view of some uh, entity that you care about. So it typically could be a customer if you're a company, or it could be a patient. Uh, it could be an individual uh, if you are dealing with healthcare or public health, right? So that thing that you care about is sort of referred to as the fact, and that and that fact has many dimensions associated with it. So that's this idea of a star. Um, so for example, uh, we might care about a person uh, and person's health and well-being, and a person might have diff different dimensions like their uh, you know sickness record, which is essentially the electronic health record. Every time they got sick, there is some entry in the EHR. Uh, but it could also have something about their activity, their food habit, uh, where have they traveled, what's their family information. So those would all be the dimensions. And um, to push on that analogy a little further, there is also this notion of a snowflake schema. That is, each of those dimensions itself might have a little bit of a structure. But these are the kind of things that we deal with when we talk about a data warehouse. 
Um, I won't go too much into this slide, but it sort of repeats what I said before. Uh, there are governance issues involved. Uh, governance, by the way, is is a word that's coming back uh, today in, in today's sort of data-driven world, as people realize that they really want to use data to make decisions, whether it's a serious scientific discovery uh, or a corporation making you know some strategic decisions. And governance then is important because you need to know things like provenance. You need to know where did this data come from, what did we do with this data. Uh, so just as an aside, um, the federal government has started something called the, uh, it's actually called the Federal Data Cabinet, but it's, it's a collection of all the chief data officers across federal agencies, and now there are about 125 or so people in that group. And I sit in on that, just representing NSF, and one of the first things, first groups they started uh, was a group that was going to look at governance. And, and you know, your first step in governance is to figure out what are the data assets that we have. And your next step is to say, well, what can we say about the quality of these assets, right? So data, the data governance is an important thing, and warehouses really do focus on all of that. Um, but they are not good for unstructured data. There is latency between when the data comes into an organization and when it gets into a data warehouse for all the reasons we just mentioned. So data lakes, in a sense, are trying to address that. And data lake is a new, relatively new concept. It's a relatively new thing. If, depending on who you talk to, people will either say, well, that's a very important thing, or others will say, ah, this is a waste of time, or this is a way just revisiting other stuff. And, uh, the, there's now the word data swamp, uh, which refers to if you put all sorts of data into one place, you know, is it really useful? We are just creating a swamp of data. So <laughs> there are all these issues, but um, the problem is really, uh, and by the way, and a lot of these data lakes are built on top of this Hadoop technology, which is a highly scalable technology because the point of data lakes is you want to throw all your data into it, right? And you want to start doing some easy analytics. And as you heard before, a lot of the analytics may be going after unstructured data. They may not be in relational databases. You may actually be writing a program or a script of some sort uh, that wants to deal with sort of relatively unstructured uh, flat flat files, really. And so it's back to the flat file world, and the lakes uh, support that. Okay, um, so the data lakes are increasingly also going towards this notion of, uh, I mean, you know, some structuring of data within the lake and uh, some of the ideas you will see uh, that corporations are embracing there is this notion of a pipeline. So your data may come and land in some landing zone uh, where it's all non-clean, uh, whatever data you collected. And there may be a, a sequence of steps that it goes through um, and that creates this sort of workflow process. That's actually a useful thing because then you might have different applications that might say, you know what, I'm willing to go after the dirty, dangerous data, or another application might say, I'm going to go after data in, in stage three after this cleaning has been done. So at least it creates that opportunity rather than having to say, well, you can't do anything until all the data is cleaned up. So so there are some positives to it, but um, you know, you have to be a little bit careful in how you're creating these uh, these kinds of assets. So now let me flip to a project. Uh, turns out it's um, it's a project at UC San Diego that, that I've, I've been involved in and not so much involved in the last couple of years since I've come to NSF. Um, and it's actually led by our fearless leader there is Kevin Patrick, who is in a population and public health uh, at UC San Diego. Uh, there are other, so almost half the team is from the med school. They have Ted Chan, who is the actually lead, head, heads the Beacon project in San Diego. For, <clears throat> for those of you who know about the Beacon, Initiative. We're just trying to integrate data from all sorts of different EHR and other systems. Uh, Lucila Ono Machado is our bioinformatics person, but the other half of the project is computer scientists. Um, so Yanis and Sanjay and so on are, are professors in computer science. And the idea that we had here was, um, in a sense, this I you know what warehouses and lakes are trying to do. That is, in order to look at the whole information related to an individual, you know, the whole of the health information, you need to put together data from different sources. And of course, there are many projects that, that have that are 
been doing it, are doing it, and we continue to do it. But our idea in this project was, can we try to standardize some of this so that we don't have to repeat the same thing again and again. A lot of people trying to do the same thing and trying to put together maybe activity data with EHR data, with pollution data. Uh, let's try to see if we can make common APIs, common processes, so that others don't have to repeat that. So that's basically the idea. Um, and we came up with this notion of a whole health information model and an API to facilitate that. Um, and I just wanted to mention that because this is a classic example of trying to integrate very heterogeneous data. It has semi-structured sources in there. It has structured sources in there. Um, I don't think initially we were going after any text or unstructured or even video. Uh, but, you know, that might be one of the things you might put in there. Uh, what it's trying to do is integrate information from very different layers. So, so it's not, um, as Kevin likes to point out, it's not about uh, just integrating information inside a hospital or inside a clinical setting. It's actually about integrating all the health information related to a person, some of which may be from a hospital, but a lot of it has to do with behavioral and environmental. And, and if you really think in terms of the whole health, that's in some ways could be a lot more important than just sort of your disease and uh, sickness uh, record. So anyway, that's sort of the goal of that project. Uh, and so flipping back to the kinds of data that we'll encounter, as, as Elena said before, we are not going to get into the details, but we're trying to give you a sort of a quick survey of things. So coming back to this notion of structured, semi-structured, and so-called unstructured, what do we mean by that? Uh, from a computer science point of view, I said that earlier, um, Already we think of a database as something that's structured as the notion of a data model, it's a formal specification of the data, uh, and a query language that allows you to query that. Actually, another important thing that relational databases uh, do have is this notion of integrity constraints. And they are very important in order to make sure that your data uh, is clean, right? So and a simple integrity constraint could be that social sec security number is a unique number. You can't have two people with the same social security number. Another constraint could be that if somebody is working in a department, the name of that, that department should exist, right? So you couldn't be working in a department that doesn't exist. So that led to a set of um, characteristics that are associated with structured databases uh, referred to as ACID, uh, atomicity, consistency, isolation, durability. These are all essentially transaction properties that make sure that everything you do with the database results in a correct state of the database, that you can't uh, do transactions and queries on a database and mess up the database. And so the database ensures that that doesn't happen. We won't go into the details of each of those technical things, but that's an important concept because we are back to this sort of little bit of a Wild West world, as we said before, with NoSQL, JSON, uh, some of which will have this notion of relaxed consistency. You might see the, the term where it's not necessarily always true that the database is consistent and therefore applications have to be very careful uh, that they may be encountering data that's not completely clean. And again, sometimes you have to, re the reason they relax those constraints is in order to be able to deal with either the volume of the data or the rate of the data. If you're dealing with data that's coming in very fast, you may not just have enough time to make sure that it's all consistent and so on. So it's, it's useful to know that, you know, we are back to the world where we're breaking some of the uh, rules that we had before. Um, so, you know, in structured databases, everything looks very regular, like in a relational database, all rows have the same format, etc. cetera. Uh, Semi-structured databases, as was mentioned, are, an example would be XML. And they tend, they, they, they allow for a little bit, actually for ad hoc uh, structures. Um, so if you think about a bibliography at the end of uh, an article uh, would have all sorts of things in it, like papers, books, other, all sorts of other things. And each of those might have a slightly different structure. Uh, and you may not want to bend over backwards and try to put all of that into a relational database. A semi-structured model makes a lot of sense there. A lot of web pages have that kind of structure, right? Uh, even if the content in the web page nowadays may come from a, a database of some sort, the overall structure itself may be uh, uh, better represented as a semi-structure. So I won't go into the uh, syntax details, etc. Uh, just quickly, uh, some of the trends where we are going, um, 
it turns out as we re represent more and more complex information, whether it's say cellular interactions or human interactions, uh, graphs are a very important uh, type of data. A and now on the technology side, people are beginning to build systems that efficiently support uh, graph data. So one of the things we do with graph data, it it's still useful to be able to query a graph, right? So you can say, get me all the nodes in this graph that have certain properties. But the other things you do with graphs are traversing the graph. We, want, we might want to find the shortest path between X and Y, and the, and the path might represent some, say, connections between uh, cells in the brain, right? And the NIF people, you heard about the neuroscience information facility last time, they do a lot of those kinds of things. Graphs may also represent uh, semantic linkages, what we call ontologies, uh, between terms. So there are a lot of cases where graphs turn up and uh, graph data uh, is, is increasingly very important kind of data, might end up dominating big parts of some of the applications. That's a graph of actually my LinkedIn network. Um, and we are also moving towards this notion of creating knowledge graphs so that we can build in the semantics and, and understand the meanings of the terms that we are referring to and the relationships between them. And I think we have heard about these concepts in some of the other talks and probably we'll hear more. Uh, this is clearly, you know, there is something called semantic PubMed where people are trying to extract the semantics of the articles and, and make those connections between articles based on the meaning of the stuff uh, rather than just, you know, the specific words. Uh, another trend that's rapidly approaching, and my own view is in future everything, we'll think of everything as a stream, except some streams will be much slower than others, <laughs> is data streams. And that's because the rate at which data is coming at us, uh, regardless of what the source of data is, is just growing in, uh, more and more. And so everything starts looking like just a sequence of stuff. And examples right now are things like log files on a computer, uh, e-commerce purchases, uh, what people call click streams, you know, when you're clicking on a website, uh, game information, information from social networks, uh, you know, Twitter tweets uh, look, are all streams and so on. So there's, there's a lot of this going on. And there are new technologies that are being developed. Uh, uh, one of the ones, this is just one example, is from Amazon called Kinesis uh, that allows you to sort of capture the stream of stuff coming in. And here the example is mobile phones, but uh, the project that uh, I've been working on with Kevin Patrick, actually there are a couple of other projects that I didn't mention involving MD Anderson Cancer Center is where we are putting uh, sensors on people, you know, whether it's smartphones or other kinds of sensors uh, and measuring various bodily uh, parameters and those are all coming in as streams and there's going to be more and more of that as I'm sure you're all familiar with and then at the end of it that data could go into all sorts of different storage and that's what S3, Redshift, Amazon Elasticsearch are all again different ways of storing this. So like we said before, your menu of options uh, are many right now. So finally, some uh, take home messages. Uh, so when you're looking at the data, each of us as individuals might be focused on one aspect of it, but really every piece of data has a life cycle and increasingly we have to worry about it. You know, how was it collected? Where did it come from? Uh, and where is it going to end up? Um, and people are very concerned nowadays that uh, even in, 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 especially in academia, we think of a paper as the ultimate goal. The ultimate goal really should be the data that's related with the paper and where does the data end up? So until that data has ended up somewhere safely, uh, we shouldn't say that your work is not. You know, just publishing a paper shouldn't be the end of it. Performance, I mean, speaking as computer people, and, and I know Anita mentioned something about this last time, uh, that computer scientists care a lot about performance. Yes, we do. Making things go fast, that's what I mean. And, and actually, going fast can be a game changer, right? Just think about it. If every little data pr uh, step that you had to do took forever, that will completely change how you do your data analysis. If things go very fast, it's a big enabler. So we are all, computer science is always focused on how to make it go uh, faster and faster. Um, other take-home message is in the data in the world of data science, there are a lot of different problems, and really goes back to the life cycle question. There's everything from cleaning to prediction, and there are all these tools you can use uh, along along the way. Uh, so increasingly, you know, you're in an environment where you can actually use the right data management tool for the right job. It just means you need to have some awareness of. Uh, what is available, but also what might you be giving up if you pick one option versus the other? So what does it buy you, right? 
And finally, of course, there is the context issue. Maybe it's, you know, is it something you're just doing by yourself? You're doing it in the lab, an institution context, uh, maybe a community, which, which may uh, either give you more options or may restrict what you can do. So that's, that's just sort of the big picture. The last thing I want to say is something that we've been um, looking at here in the world of data science. So if you think about sort of the agenda of data as it's going to grow into the future, data is going to be more and more important to us everywhere in our lives, right? Um, and there's going to be a lot of decisions whether we make them or some automated device or a robot makes them will all be data driven. Uh, so here I'm starting with an example of just computer science, our own discipline. Com in computer science itself, there are areas in CS that are becoming uh, more data intensive. So there's more and more data available to do research in computer science. An example would be internet traffic. There's a whole network research community in computer science that uh, researches internet traffic and tries to understand what's going on on the internet by looking at that traffic. The amount of traffic is just tremendously growing, obviously. Another one is data center logs. You know, increasingly we have these massive data centers with lots of computers, and you can actually look at the logs that have all sorts of information about the performance, the temperature, etc. And actually, you can use that to optimize energy consumption and all sorts of other things. So there is an example just in computer science of data coming at us and us having to deal with it uh, to do better computer science research. Now, we happen to think that data science and actually engineering, which is a very important part uh, related to data, uh, is a thing unto itself. I mean, it's, it's almost like a discipline to itself is, is data science and engineering, which has its own theories. NSF, for example, just released a solicitation for developing the principles of data science. Um, and there are issues like data representation, and we mentioned some of that today. Uh, modeling, whether it's statistical modeling or you know, representation modeling, machine learning, decision support, reproducibility. I think this, all of those together form the sort of discipline of data science and engineering. And our idea is that um, there is a translational aspect, which is the aspect of taking all these principles and theories of data science and applying it to real world problems. Okay, And that application, there is some analogy to this notion of translational medicine where you're talking about taking research results and applying it in the clinical context. Really what all of us, many of us at least, do with data is it's the clinical context of data, right? We're using data in the real world and we're thinking what techniques should I use on that data? That's translational stuff. And so there are obviously data intensive everything going on, whether it's biology, geoscience, medicine, and so on. Uh, so we see an opportunity here to think about a sort of uh, a lot of what's actually being done there is, is really translational work, and, and we're trying to pursue that uh, idea a little bit further here at NSF. And and I think that's that's it. There's there's a few more minutes for questions. Great, thank you so much, Dr. Spurians and Seleva. That was a great talk. Um, so we have one question from the audience at this point, which is um, about the data lake and the data warehouse. So. Uh, the question is, can data be put into the data lake and into the data warehouse at the same time as it's being prepared for the data warehouse? And could you comment a little bit about, about that sort of uh, potential parallel sort of framework? Yes, it's a good question. And, and, and uh, in a sense, the answer, I guess, is a qualified yes, only in the sense that, like I said, the data warehouse is definitely very, very prescriptive. Right, you, things can't go into the data warehouse unless they meet a certain set of conditions. That, that's sort of the notion of a warehouse. Uh, as we said, a lake, you could more or less dump anything in there. Uh, but we also said that in a data lake, people are now beginning to actually talk about phases of the data. So the data could go through multiple phases of structuring and cleaning. So it could be that at some point in that uh, process, the data has reached the level of cleanliness, let's say, that your data warehouse would say, okay, I can accept that, and then you would do it. And, and the reason to do it is uh, data warehousing, by the way, is a big industry, <laughs> you know, probably multiple billion dollar industry. So there are a lot of good tools uh, and you know, querying tools, analysis tools, as well as visualization tools for your data. So you may want to 
actually use all of those things, whereas Data Lake is still a little bit out there in the Wild West right now. Uh, so that might be a reason why you want to do both, yeah. Okay, um, so another question is, uh, oftentimes when we're designing these types of databases, the queries themselves are not necessarily known ahead of time, and, and often we want to design these databases in order to sort of optimize the query response. But without knowing the queries, or if we're trying to support sort of an exploratory um, uh, set of data and, and, and queries in, in that nature, um, it's very difficult to know ahead of time which type of database we should be using, what type of, of data uh, schema we should be using. Are, are there any approaches, for instance, that take a hybrid approach where data actually goes into multiple different types of databases simultaneously? Uh, actually, another excellent question. Okay, so the uh, first answer I want to give you there is actually something I didn't cover. Maybe I should have. Maybe we can do it in the future. Is this notion of poly stores? Um, it's still, I would say, more in the computer science communities. So poly as in P-O-L-Y store. And polystore idea is exactly what you're saying, uh, where people are uh, people are realizing that you know here's an application that I, I'm interested in, but this application has different kinds of data that are all related to that application, and the different kinds could mean some of it is structured. I know it's structured. Uh, other of it is I'm not quite sure what the structure is, but another piece of it may be a graph. I actually derive. So so I might uh, Im imagine this situation. I might have text. And I might process the text uh, to derive certain a uh, graph out of it. Maybe it's a graph of all the people in that text and the connections among the people. Uh, but I want to keep both. I want to keep it. I want to keep the text of it, but I also want to keep the derived graph of it. So the graph might actually go into a graph database. The text might just stay in some system that does indexing of the text, and you might also have structures. So in in computer science, uh, and there are some startup companies I'm aware of that are now beginning to do this kind of thing saying let's invent a poly store and in a way try to take that responsibility from the user and put it in the system. So the user, right now I don't think that part is there yet. Right now the user still has to say well this is a graph and that's a text and this is that and I want you to manage all of these but uh, people are also looking at things like maybe the same data could be in, in multiple representations um, and also maybe the system can decide at what point can it go from one to the other. Um, but until that happens, I mean, so, that, so that's one technology that's coming. You might want to look for it. The other way to do it is actually to use the semi-structured. And uh, what I've heard um, is, uh, you know, just look out. I, I think you'll, you'll find uh, increasingly more vendors um, providing more support for semi-structured data. So in a, in a semi-structured world, you can certainly have a structured part of it. You can just say, well, that part of it is fixed, right? And this other part is variable. So, so you could use a semi-structured model to do that. OK, so I think we have one uh, time for one more question, which is, um, so one of the interesting things, in, at least in the biomedical uh, space, in, is about scientific re reproducibility. And uh, could you speak? to the provenance of the data, and in, particularly in, in terms of the translational data processes that um, a database may support. Yes, and uh, <coughs> I actually think you know, there's a lot of work has gone on um, sort of in computer science research um, about this notion of provenance. Um, by the way, you know, I think there are even work at least workshops, I don't think conferences, that have talked about prominence big data. <laughs> that is, you can imagine now that, you know, not only do you have this little itty bitty piece of data that you care about, but if you kept all its provenance, the provenance can be huge compared to the data that you have. So people are already starting to worry about what's the explosion that's going to happen in the amount of data that I start keeping the provenance of it. Uh, what we don't have yet, I believe, is good systems, you know, software systems or products that do a good job. I mean, there are certainly uh, products that are trying to help in that way. Uh, I don't think it's zero, but I think that that part of it is just beginning to happen. So I, I think something a lot more systematic and, and software systems need to be available so that every one of us could be using um, 
uh, using this in, uh, you know using provenance with our data I'm just beginning I'm just thinking about you know, in, in the computer science world there is a lot of research uh, here's one example so even when you run an SQL query you know it's a very structured database SQL is a structured language you get a result back right? and for those of you who are familiar with SQL you know, so you have joins, right? So you might have lots of joins going on and uh, things like this, and you get a result back. And a lot of times, you might want to say, "Well, how did this particular row appear in this result set? I wasn't expecting it." So people are actually looking at actually the provenance of individual rows in the query of a relational database, which actually itself turns out to be quite an interesting, challenging problem. That user should be able to click on a row and say, "Tell me how this came in." Right? And, and the system should be able to say, well, this came in because I joined that with this and we selected this one over there and this lands up here. So these are all beginning to happen and it's just going to be even more uh, even more data. And, and, and also there's a recent paper somebody just sent me um, about why all of this is actually going to end up becoming a big uh, computational burden as well. Okay, so I think we're out of time. Um, so thank you again so much for this wonderful talk. We're getting a lot of positive feedback already from, from uh, the attendees, and uh, we'll end it here. Thank you. All right, great. Thanks. We're, we're glad to be with you.